The whole scene really was concentrated on Max's and CBGB's. Some bands were Max's bands, some bands were CBGB's bands, and sometimes there was crossover. The Heartbreakers were Max's band, straight up. Um, and part of the reason they were Max's band is because Max's paid them a lot more than Hilly paid his bands. And Max's also gave them the infamous advance that Jerry taught Johnny about. There was rumors that, 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 that Johnny and Jerry had teamed up with Richard Hell to you know, put together the Heartbreakers. So we heard that last week. I didn't know that they were looking for another guitar player. The Heartbreakers were Richard Hell and Johnny Sanders and Walter Roar and Jerry Nolan. You can't get more drug saturated than that. You know, I'd, I'd be sitting and watching and getting off and, you know, and the whole, it was a, this cool thing. It yeah, had to be cool to do it. And, you know, they didn't really force me to do it, but of course it was part of the whole part and parcel of the band and the, and the, the attitude. So, and the whole junkie, be a junkie, be a beatnik, be cool thing. So, of course, like, like, like an idiot, like, I started trying it. Hey, Listen, listen, you can't eat shit, shit. Cool the fucking goblin, you know. Goblin, goblin, your mother. Goblin, baby. And that's what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to come out on stage with fucking fire extinguishers and get you douchebag. and after Jet Boy, you were playing with Johnny Thunders and Jerry Nolan at the same time, right? Yeah, I did some gigs with those boys. <laughs> There's no more punk rock credibility than that. You played with four yeah. New York dolls. Yeah, man, you know, that's, uh, I'm a lucky boxer, you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it, it was really funny because we, we played, I got to know, Johnny and Jerry, we did a, a tour in the UK with Hanoi in, I think, 83. 
or 84 and and uh we did some shows we did a tour together with johnny jerry wasn't in the band then but uh after hanno split up i moved to uh to sweden back to stockholm and and i was sitting in the subway and in the back of the train they're sitting jerry Norman and johnny thunder so i was like what the fuck are they doing here you know sitting in the subway train and i walked over them and i was like hey he's I mean, how you doing, man? You know, it's like I'm living here. It's like, yeah, we live in two here, man. You know, so where do you live? And it turns out that Jerry lived one subway stop from me, and Johnny lived two subway stops from the outskirts of Stockholm in the suburbs. So weird. And so we started hanging out, and I would go to Johnny's house and spend afternoons over there with my kid, you know. And Johnny would play cars with my kid. It's like, hey, come here, Nicky, man. You know, catch this, catch the ball, man. <laughs> and uh he would play his new song ideas and then we would watch some you know humphrey bogart movies or wc fields movies or whatever and it's just you know we, we were friends and he would call every now and then and go like hey sammy you want to make some money <laughs> it's like yeah why not john you know and, and uh i i love those dudes a lot they were one of a kind they would never make anybody like Before we go on the uh, Mask of Smiles, um, and I mentioned uh, Johnny Thunders before, uh, of course Thunders lays down some guitar on the track yeah. No Breaks, and you reference him in um, in downtown, yeah. Johnny Thunders on the radio, yeah. but you can't put your arms around a memory. Um, had you struck up a friendship with Thunders, and it makes me want to ask if you in fact saw the Dolls when they played London in the early 70s? No, I didn't. That was okay. before my time, or I wasn't aware of it. Frankie LaRock, I knew about the Dolls. Um, a lot of my girlfriends around that point uh, knew about the dolls for some mm. reason. They like mm. women. Women like the dolls. Mm. But Frankie LaRocca, um, the late great Frankie LaRocca, the drummer, he turned me on to Johnny as a as a, 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 a talent all in his own right. And um, 
you know, I mean, if you look back at Johnny's life, he lived it to the max, you know? And he was an icon. He was a truthful thing. I mean, from all accounts, he was a complete pain in the ass. He was junked out of his head. Blah, 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 blah. But put him on stage, and it's like watching... Uh, it's like... A, it's like Kabuki theater or something. It's like... But it's like got Shakespeare in it. And it's Jean-Paul Sartre. You know, it's like everything is happening at once. And he could drop dead in the middle of a song, you know. And he was... You know, iconic to me. I called I called his manager, or I can't remember how I did it. But I said, hey, Johnny, if you want to come down and play, I'll give you a thousand bucks in cash. You know, we're, we're in Clinton Studios in Hell's Kitchen. And he showed up, mm. you know. And um, I sent everybody home. We went in the studio and, uh, and cut the track. You know, it was like, it was really painful. You know, when he died, uh, Steve Marriott died. Mm. In the it was in the mixing of the second bad English record, and then two weeks later Johnny died, mm. and uh, I threw the towel in. I, I think at that point I was I was thinking about maybe staying in bad English, but when Johnny died as well as Steve Marriott, I thought fuck it, you know mm. this is a message. I've got to get out of here. You know, and, So all you ghosts, what's happening, man? How's life treating you? Are you people happy, or are you bored, or are you, should, you think you should be dead? Can somebody tell me why does Sweden have the biggest suicide rate? Too much fucking snow, man. And the snow ain't cocaine, man. It's white and it's cold. This one's the anthem of probably your generation and mine. It's called Dirty Socks. I mean Chinese rocks.
Five shows at the Marquee. With the Heartbreakers? With the Heartbreakers, wow. yes. Jerry Nolan, Billy Rath, and myself. How do you feel about being back in London playing? Um, I really like playing in London. It's, it's a nice city to play in. You get better response here than, say, New York? Mm, I get the best response in New York. But an acceptable one here? Excuse me? An acceptable one here. Yeah, yeah, the kids are all right. What have you been doing for the past two or three years? Past two or three years, I've been uh, getting myself together and uh, playing music, what I've always been doing. Getting my health together, mostly. Though. And where do you live these days? I live in Paris. Why there? Why not your home? Why not where? Why not New York? Well, uh, it wasn't uh, advantageous to my health to stay in New York, so I moved to Paris. What do you mean by that? I mean, uh, it just wasn't good for my health. <laughs> well, the pace of life? Or... <laughs> my pace of life. And how is it different in Paris, then? It's a slower pace. Are you referring to drugs? Uh, I'm just referring to life. What's your position on drugs these days? Drugs? I could take them or leave them. How often do you take them? Um, I'll tell you how often I leave them, every day. No, I don't take drugs no more. You don't need them? Um, I don't take them. <laughs> but doesn't it help you to write and perform? Hmm. It helps me get through all the, the slush you got to get through to get on stage, but um, no, it doesn't help me write or perform. And you work well enough now without using drugs. Yeah, yeah, I'm really fine. What kind of material are you working on these days? Are you doing any new stuff? Yeah, um, I'm doing a lot of writing. Writing new songs with uh, Jerry Nolan for our new record we're going to make in the summer. But you're still playing the old stuff? Yeah, some of the old stuff. I mean, you have to play the old stuff because the kids won't hear it. We have new stuff in our set. What do you think about the sort of music people are playing now, comparing it with 1977, for example? Actually, I really don't listen to music, so, so I really don't know what's being played. You have no idea what's going on? I don't listen to music at all. I mean, occasionally, when I'm in a car, I listen to a radio, but I really don't know what kids are listening to. You mentioned already that you quite like playing that prefer New York, but you quite like London. Your attitude to audiences has been mixed, in my opinion, anyway. You've always struck me as being someone who doesn't like an audience. You even abuse Yes, you know, I had a problem where I didn't like myself because of drugs, and I took it out on the audience, but that's all changed now. You couldn't quite enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I've always enjoyed it. It's just I didn't enjoy myself for a long time, and therefore I took it out on the audience. What do you think the audience think when they come and see you now, though? Do they want to be abused, sir? Oh, yeah, a lot of people want to be abused, but I'm not going to abuse them. Unless, not, unless they abuse me. <laughs> you may not be giving the audience what they want. I think I give them what they want. I mean, they come to hear music, and I play music. Tell me a bit about what happened in Sweden, the fact that you're still banned over there. No, I'm, well, not, I'm not banned no more. I was banned. Um, there were some problems because of tours I've done, you know. It, it attracted a lot of press and a lot of bad press, or good press. I mean, all press is good. It's, it's bad when they stop writing about you, I think. And um, they didn't want me back in the country. But then um, we fought it up to, up to like, um, the government, and uh, we won. And we had two successful tours since then. Can you tell me something about the other things you're doing, the films? Yeah, I'm doing uh, two films out of Paris. Uh, one is entitled Personality Crisis, and one is entitled Traffico. Mm. Uh. 
There's a couple of personal questions, really, about how mm -hmm. you spend your spare time. Literally that, how do you spend your spare time? Actually, I see a lot of films. I see a lot of videos. I mean, that occupies most of my time when I'm not working. I don't go out very much. You don't socialize? Not too much. Not in Paris? Not too much. <laughs> I thought Paris was somewhere where you couldn't possibly do anything but socialize. I don't know, I don't speak French, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to socialize. So how would you describe the new look Johnny Thunders? The new look? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's not a new look, it's the same look with uh, the same sound, only more together. And the future? The future is something that I have a lot of control on myself about what I'm doing, you know, I'm in the right frame of mind, and I really can handle the work now. Final question. What advice would you give a young musician? Would you ask, would you suggest he followed the same road that you followed? I mean, I wouldn't advise anybody to follow the same road I'm, I followed, but, um, you know, just read a lot, watch a lot of television, and don't go out and play too much. And drugs? And drugs. And don't take drugs, it's very harmful. Thank you. Thank you. And it's true. Okay. Yes.
Before we talk about the Heartbreakers, who are reformed and uh, are available in London tomorrow, performing live, can we go right back to the beginning, as they, as they say, 1972 anyway, with the New York Dolls, and that amazing period, what was it like? Oh, it was just crazy, hectic, you know, it was a lot of fun. I mean, the best way to put it, it was fun. I mean, we just did it because it was a lot of fun for us. At that time, uh, New York was really burgeoning, full of new talent. Yeah, there was a lot of new bands. What created that sort of spark at that uh, stage? I think that dolls stage? were a big part of starting all that, I think. Why is that? Why were the dolls Why so that? instrumental? Well, we were the first ones really to start the whole new thing in 72. But then an awful lot of other names came in, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, a lot of names, yeah. Was there an awareness at the time that it was an important stage for the music scene? I mean, everybody knew something was going to happen, but not, nobody knew exactly what, you know? Why was that? Because you're working from day to day? or Yeah, it was definitely, you know, day to day, hand to mouth. Were you making much money in those days? No, we weren't making much money, but we were surviving. Why is it that the whole thing took so long, and maybe it never did it, to break out of New York and actually hit the whole of America? Oh, it took, you know, ten years for it to happen, I think. And, you know, people learn slowly, very slowly it takes people to pick up on something and to realize it's good. They're afraid to like things, some people. Mm. It was an odd thing, though, that while America was slow, uh, there were people writing in magazines like Melody Maker in this country yeah. that there was one heck of a scene and there was mm -hmm. this band called the New York Dolls that was creating such a stir. You came over to this country, actually, didn't you? Yeah, right. We were together, I think, six months, and we came over and we did um, the Wembley Pool with Rod Stewart. And, I mean, the biggest crowd we ever played in front of was maybe 700 people, and that was like, I don't know, 20,000, 18,000. It was... Quite, quite a lot of fun. Could have been a real springboard. In fact, tragically, it didn't turn out to be yeah. that good for the band in the end, did it? No, not that true. 1975 was when you met up with uh, Mr. McLaren. Yeah, and that was a large part why everything uh, went the way it did. Why? What, what why? was the influence I mean, of uh, Malcolm McLaren on the, the New York Dolls in the end? Well, Malcolm had this thing um, that he thought we just had to dress good and he didn't really care about the music so much, I think, basically. And, you know, we played good. And... I don't know, it was just, we never hit, hit it off together. He was English, we were American. And, uh, we were see, uh, see apart. Yeah. Was he practicing, in a way, for what he did later with the Sex Pistols? Well, if you're asking me that, there's your own answer. You're not going to say anything more than that? Do I have to? OK, all right, because I, it strikes me that you were much more of a, an influence on uh, what happened here later. In yeah, fact. we were. England picked it up and they took it a step further. Do you enjoy looking back on the period? Sure, I love it. And the old records? Yeah. You're going to hear one now. Okay. Thank you. 
Jet Boy from the very first LP recorded by the Dolls. Uh, why did you and Jerry eventually decide to split from the band? Because well, things seemed to be working quite smoothly at that time. Well, what happened was we left our management <clears throat> and started working with Malcolm. We had about six new songs in our set. We were tired of playing the old, the old stuff. And uh, Malcolm convinced the boys to stay in Florida and keep touring and playing the old stuff. And me and Jerry wanted to go back write a few more songs and have a whole new set and come out fresh. But, um, well, actually, we, did, we couldn't agree on that, so me and Jerry split back to New York and called up Richard Hatlin and started the Heartbreak. Which was doing, I take it, the set that you would have liked to have done originally with the Dolls. Pretty much. Why did you decide to work with Malcolm again and come over to Britain when you did? Well, we liked the scene at the Sex Pistols. We thought the Sex Pistols were a great rock and roll band, and we thought, come over and, you know, be part of the tour would be great. Bury the hatchet with Malcolm. Yeah, basically. Good move? Yeah. I thought it was all right at the time. Is it, uh, looking back on it, do you think it was all right as well? Yeah. yeah, I think it was pretty important. Yeah. On what sort of level? For the kids. For the kids out there. I mean, for them to get a taste of what happened five years before and what's happened then. I, mean, I thought it was a good culture shock for them. Uh, that was the period when you uh, first recorded LAMF, which is now right. being mixed. But since then, you've been, well, more recently, uh, domiciled, as it says, in the press pile, uh, in Paris, mm -hmm. doing very different sort of music. Yeah, I made an uh, acoustic album. It's something I always wanted to do. I always read a lot of songs up that I couldn't play live in the band, and live on stage, and I thought, you know, I had the opportunity to do an acoustic record, and I said, what the hell, you know, I have all these songs, I don't do anything with them. Why not make an acoustic record? How's it gone? Has it, has it been successful? Remarkably, it's done pretty well. I think it's done very well. Okay. Now, you've Called been... Hurt Me. Hurt Me. Right. We'll make a note of that. But well, you've been doing that. Um, Walter, working as a commodity broker on Wall Street. Yeah, believe it or not, yeah. That's great. He's having a quick vacation now with the Heartbreakers. He goes back to work on Wednesday. <laughs> Why revive the Heartbreakers now? I mean, if you've got this well, thing going and he's got his commodities to look after. Well, I have a lot of different things going. You know, I mean... I... I play with the Heartbreakers this week. I have, I'm doing a movie next week, you know. Doing a movie next week? Yeah. I go Something back. I've been started, started a movie last weekend. We go back next weekend um, to finish it up. It's a movie I'm doing in French with a, France with a French director called Patrick de Grand Paré. It's called uh, Personality Crisis. And you're acting in it? Yeah. Do you enjoy that? Is this yeah, a, it's a new career for me, I think. Why did you go back and remix LAMF? Well, the Jungle Records wanted to put it out. And the way it sounds originally was, you know, it was underwater. It was horrible. And um, the music was always great. It was all on the tape, but it was just never brought out. So You got the masters out again, did you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's about time, you know, it finally sounded good after, uh, I don't know how many years it is.
is that because God can't keep my eyes on you. I'd like, um, I'd like to introduce you to Richard Hall. I'm very pleased to be interviewing him tonight. So, uh, Richard. <laughs> No, I mean I didn't. I didn't have any discussions with Johnny and Jerry about them leaving the Dolls or me leaving television before it happened. Um, uh, we played that gig, and I didn't know Johnny that well. I mean, uh, that's the only time we ever played with him. And he would come around to CBGBs, and, and he'd see me play, and we, you know, sat around, and had drinks together. But um, uh, you know, the Dolls were still like. Um, you know, they were, uh, they were on a level above, you know, because they, they were making records and they, they had such a big impact in New York. Um, though, you know, it was pretty clear 
uh, after the release of that first record, and then the second record um, really um, uh, was, you know, a decline for sure. Um, um, that you know, it's pretty clear that things were kind of falling apart uh, there, though. Um, no, we hadn't discussed it. Um, it j what happened is that I just got a phone call from him. He'd heard um, that I left the band, uh, and he and Jerry had just decided to leave the Dolls, and he wanted to uh, make a band with me. So, um, but yeah, there wasn't any discussion in advance. It wasn't like, listen, I'm ready to leave television, and you guys ready to leave the Dolls, and nothing like that. I was surprised, really surprised when I heard from him. I didn't know the dolls. I didn't know that he was going to leave the dolls. And I, when they were in Florida, he called me from Florida, as I recall. I think I'm right about that. Um, they'll maybe just come back to New York from there. But anyway, um, I, uh, I was surprised he found out so quickly that I'd left television because it was within a couple of days of my, my having decided I was leaving. Um, yeah, well, the way that we talked about it being, what we, and you know, what I, uh, what we, what our plans for the Heartbreakers uh, were, were the same as what television was when we first started television, which is that there were two singers and songwriters in the group, and television was me and Tom, and Heartbreakers was me and Johnny. Um, though. Um, and that pretty much the, the we we share the uh, the singing and, and songwriting, um, though actually in the Heartbreakers, uh, the assumption was that I'd be doing more of it. That Johnny would be uh, uh, because he had never really been a singer, and I you know I I uh, at, at the beginning in television I was singing like every third song, and the idea was I would be singing more as I wrote more. And it ended up going the other direction, but um, uh, but uh, they were basically inviting me to be the singer, um, though it was understood that uh, Johnny uh, would, would be writing some songs too, and he'd be singing the ones he wrote. Uh, um, but when we started, it was pretty even. Um, because I didn't want to try to do the songs with the Heartbreakers that Tom and I had written together. And that was the majority of the ones that I'd done on television. I'd only written maybe three or four by myself uh, because when I first started, I was just writing lyrics until I got a better idea of how to go about writing music. Um, so there were, you know, four or five songs that I'd done in television that Tom had written the music for, and I didn't want to do those. I wanted the ones that I did with the Heartbreakers to be ones that I just wrote myself. So um, I only had three or four songs to start with, and he had three or four already, uh, you know, that he'd written. Um, so it was fairly, it was pretty easy. Yeah, we, we immediately had a following. I mean, it wasn't like we had to build an audience. Yeah, it was, there'd been enough people who had been into what I was doing and enough people who had been into what he was doing. So. Um, yeah, we, we were immediately at the same level as the most successful local groups. Well, you know, uh, yeah, definitely New York was completely riddled with uh, narcotics at that time. Um, uh, it was half the economy of the Lower East Side. I mean, um, basically, this area here. Um, it was uh, it, it was like a, a war zone. Um, uh, it was uh, abandoned buildings, burnout blocks, um, and uh, the economy was basically uh, heroin, um, and it, it just pervaded the area, um, and. Uh, 
for, for us, uh, we could, at that time, it was early enough in our exposure to heroin that, I mean, you know, it's built into rock and roll uh, to <laughs> uh, break the rules and to reject uh, the advice of your elders and um, to uh, indulge yourself and instant gratification. And heroin was about all of those things. Um, and, and everybody felt as if um, they could outsmart it, you know, I mean, you, that you knew you had to do it every day for some weeks in, in, uh, in order for, to, to, to get a habit, and you didn't really think, uh, it, you uh, thought um, that could never happen to me. And even when you did get um, a small habit where you might, your nose might start running if you didn't do dope for a day, um, uh, and that was almost like a badge of honor, you know, just because you were that you were that far removed from ordinary society, and um, it, was, it was almost like it was it was like almost like. A, Adult, you know, you 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 uh, you entered the uh, uh, you you mature, you become mature somehow by having a dope habit. Um, uh, but it, we were really naive, you know. I mean, we didn't really know. I mean, everybody gets into to uh, heroin naively. You don't really understand what <laughs> what you're doing to yourself. Um, uh, so it was everywhere, and uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of exposure to it, and uh, we did kind of affirm it, you know. But I mean, that song is about um, uh, ab about how it's how it's ruined everything for, for you. But at the same time, truly, um, when you write a song like that, there's something. In some way, you're affirming it. You know, you're bragging about it. Just you know, um, uh, but yeah, it definitely dope was a uh, uh, played a big role in uh, the in the environment. I got more and more ambitious about. Uh, what I, you know, in a way it's kind of ironic because it, it's like I eventually realized that I wanted to have the kind of control of a group that um, Tom realized that he wanted to have control after he, you know, been in a group for a while. Yeah, I wanted a band where um, I could try um, doing things that uh, just wouldn't interest Johnny or Jerry. I mean, um, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, more kind of uh, exotic ideas of what solos would be like, or, uh, you know, this extended um, uh, sections, or uh, just messing with the possibilities that whereas they were really about driving basic rock and roll coming out of like uh, you know Eddie Cochran or whatever <clears throat> um, that's really that's really that's all they were interested in doing it was and they did it great and I loved being a part of it uh, but I just I wanted to try other kinds of stuff and um, uh, it just wouldn't have worked with the hard game, so
Oh, hello, David. How we are you? We have now with us. Hello, John. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Would you like a cocktail? Oh, we have with sure. us the fabulous Johnny Thunders of the Notorious Heartbreakers. Catch them while they're still alive. We'd like to ask you a few uh, questions about, about your upcoming European tour. It sounds very exciting. Could you give us a few details on that? Um, we're going to go on tour with a band called the Sex Pistols and the Damned. We're going to um, uh, do all of England, all of the small cities, Liverpool, Manchester, etc. Et 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 how about the larger cities like London? Yeah, Manchester, London, Paris. You know, we're going to hear all of them. Let's see. Um, and uh, can we tell us something about this, uh, these bands that you'll be touring with? I think they're real cute. That's all I know about them. Yeah, yeah. I've seen their pictures. Yeah. I haven't heard them. Yeah. 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 I hear that the, these group, the Sex Pistols, are... Uh, uh, outfitted by one of London's top clothiers. So you must be talking about Malcolm McLaren. Yes, sir. Is that the truth? Yeah. He's a meat. He's a real. He's really got an eye. He, he managed me for about two weeks. He really got an eye. Oh, and you took his pants. He had any good clothes? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we, because uh, we don't want to be wasting time here in our, in our lives as we go along. So, um, are you looking forward to this? Uh, <laughs> but you have been to Europe before. Yeah, you know, you went with me. <laughs> I know, but this is for our oh. viewers. <laughs> Excuse me. I thought we were alone. I think. So do you, do you enjoy Europe? Are you looking forward to it? Yeah. I really can't wait. I see. Oh, okay. So uh, what are the plans have you got for the Heartbreakers? Any recording plans coming up? Uh, we don't even have to record the Heartbreakers because um, <coughs> there's a new band. I don't know if they're new, they're relatively new, about six months old. They're called Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And, uh, you might try to name the Headbreakers and go visit them. I see. Um, I brought this with me. I had it in the car. No, I had another one inside here. Yeah. I have all six back in the block. That was uh, our lovely proprietor's uh, mini sledge of the fabulous CBGBs, which we've all been raving about. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll be bringing you further events. And, hey, what uh, about me, man? I ain't saying no. <laughs> no, I'll see you guys. But do you have any f further words for our TV audience? I said, that bastard over there should get a new car. <laughs> no. Now what? Cut!